Hello, hello, hello. My name is Bruce, and this is my show for Table Breakers with our good friends. To my left is Baron G. Rock. To my right is the absent chair of Connell, the Cigar DM. Oh, there he is. Down below, we have one of the greatest painters on the interwebs joining our ranks, the Crafting Gamer. And I think next to him is right? Kai, who is possibly here. I might be here. <laughs> so, Garrett, question about tonight's subject. Was this yours or was this somebody else's? Well, it was thrown out to do around uh, the uh, around this time of year since, you know, it is the 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 big horror and, and supernatural kind of set forward. So I believe it was suggested by I think it was Jade, maybe. Mm -hmm. But I'm not 100% sure, but it was on the calendar for around this time, so we're, we're rolling with it. I believe so. Garrett, how are you doing tonight? I'm here. Good deal. Final Cigar DM. We talked a lot about... We talked a lot... Oh, oh a sixth member has arrived. Oh my God! It's that guy. It's not what he does exist. He, was on the he road. does exist. Sorry, I'm late. Dinner with oh, We're happy to hear you. It's, he lives. A, it's alive. We have friends <laughs> back. Okay, so back to bright light, bright light. Um, <laughs> back to the topic at hand. We were talking about whose idea was this? Was this yours, uh, Jay, to do uh, supernatural and horror this time of month, or was it somebody else? As Jay, as Baron said, it kind of got kicked around there for a little bit. Oh, I don't remember. Um, you know, over at Gatekeepers, we've been doing an entire month of uh, horror themed um, topics. Like we started with werewolves, went to. Uh, werewolves. Um, Yep, werewolves, and then we went to witches, followed by uh, common types of undead. You know, the the most used undead, and then uh, after that, uh, last this you know just yesterday, we talked about uh, horror themed environments. The good shows to watch, to watch. So, I, I I would love to have another crack at werewolves, but with like different people. I I. Mm -hmm. I that's, I mean, I have no complaints about people over at uh, Gatekeepers, but it, I didn't think Werewolves, in my opinion, got the shine that it should have got. Okay. But that's just, I granted, I was the host, so I'm going to be biased as fuck. <laughs> okay. Oh, did you ever play The Apocalypse? I, yes. Uh, the D10 system, I was a werewolf, uh, Irish werewolf go freaking figure that was in Nashville, Tennessee, because that's where we were. And I think it was a, oh man, don't, don't crucify. <laughs> Unlike other religious items, don't crucify me if I'm wrong here. <laughs> uh, I think I was a bruja. No, that's vampire. Uh, no, that'd be vampire. Then. You mentioned a Fianna, so you're doing okay. Then I don't. I don't remember. I mean, it, I've drank and drank and well, drank and did some sleeping since then. Um, Most likely I, with I the went, combination. With I the went combination, to a little walk. Go ahead, go ahead, guy. Yeah, with the combination, you were probably like a. Um, nah, I, I'm not gonna guess what you were. What you were. I'm gonna. Shut, I'm gonna shut the fuck up now. So yeah. you started with a B. I, I that, that part, you know. Well, your guess is as good as mine. Like I said, it was forever ago. It's um, okay. there, there's a few different wearable tribes out there in that game, and there's more that are somewhat published in later source books and everything. It, it did you have fun? Oh yeah, I I I would. I would definitely go back to World of Darkness, a D10 system over rock, paper, scissors, or let me pull out my lucky uh, card deck type playing it. There's nothing wrong with LARPing. 
I do a variation of it, only I like to hit people. So rock, paper, and scissors doesn't exactly work for me when it comes to that type of LARPing. Get me a table, a character sheet, in a large pile of D10s, and I'll probably play again. Hey, not everyone likes um, one World by Night, so hey, it's okay. When I played One World by Night, we traveled, and the oddest group I ever met was out of Champaign Urbana. That doesn't surprise yeah. me. Um, yeah, it, it tracks pretty well. There were there was a bunch of brujas that they had a literally a One World by Night. So like you could show up as a werewolf or whatever mage. It, it was different, and it was for that only lasted for a little while. They they paired it back to vampires quickly after they figured that out. Um, we just don't fit anywhere. We're not allowed yeah. to have fun. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and the the guy that was our friend that was over in Champaign, he had a large enough apartment where like there was twelve of us sleeping over there over a weekend. Um, he looked a lot like the atypical Bauhaus listener. And I'm trying to take some of you back to the '80s. I mean, uh, I, I definitely went on that trip. I don't know if I want to go that far back in the 80s. No, 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 no. We were listening to Bauhaus and Sisters of Mercy the whole weekend long. Sounds about right. And that was, yeah, that, that was an interesting time in 1997. Um, well, was then, it? then we, we, did, we did one trip up to Milwaukee for the uh, uh, One World by Night because we heard he could drink up there. And literally when we got there, like we get there, we, we register our characters. We paid the, the entrance fee to get in because we're on a private site for a moment. But as soon as we got our cards and our, our gear, we found out that everybody was drinking lightly. But like the rest of the town, their idea of light drinking is what you consider <laughs> marathon <laughs> drinking. <laughs> And some people came like pre-wired with, you know, like a, a place to go and grab another Milwaukee's best, yeah. to walk around with for ten minutes between bouts of rock paper scissors. Milwaukee's beast. Yeah, there was a lot of Milwaukee's beast in Milwaukee. There were some. There was a couple of like hipsters there, but it was really weird to see like all the dad beers being represented. Like people had Falstaff, people had Schlitz, people had Schaefer. And come to find out, like, it was just, like, for that theme of that weekend, because typically it was, like, a hipster hangout, but before hipsters, because it was 97. And they're like, no, 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 let's not do the craft beer thing. Well, uh, we've got a new one coming up for November. Let's let's do this uh, dad beers. And so, like, everybody grabbed dad beers, and they stocked dad beers all over the, the LARP. It was weird. It was it was not the, the type of LARPing I thought it was going to be. And uh, after about 90 minutes, the novelty was completely worn off. The storytellers were very inept. They were better at guests and host uh, hosting than running the story. Not trying to shit on them, but kind of shit hey, on them. Everyone's experience is different, so. Starkweather has got me into the LARPing aspect of it, and that's always a weird train to hop on. So. If, if he could adult properly <laughs> yeah the, those those of you poor peoria people that know what we're talking about who we're talking about so since we're doing site uh how much supernatural and horror do you guys like in your game at this point in time jade said he's been running the uh, the train not the train running the bus over at uh uh gatekeepers so i'm gonna um, unless somebody has questions for tonight did anybody actually do questions questions i just discovered our topic about a half hour ago bueller 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 i also, hold on i also specialize in let's go by the seat of our pants give us the topic give us your questions at the moment you get the honest reveal of the answer and the expression or the, the, the tone of voice that the person has. I don't want to sound scripted. I don't want to sound like I I could calmly sound like, oh, what's that guy? Bueller. Ferris Bueller. Ben, ben Stein. Ben yeah, or ben yeah, Stein. I, yeah, I ben Stein. I don't want to sound like Ben Stein while I'm trying to crank one off over at our death by snoo snoo. 
Uh, so yes, there are questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Baron. <laughs> I just had to get in and in and open them. So uh, I think we'll start like on the supernatural side here. Uh, what are you know in in non horror games? What are some of the supernatural type of uh, foes or components that you put into your actual game to to bring out that more of the supernatural and more you know bigger than life type of uh, of uh, ambiance and also the uh i guess the is where, where to to kind of put it to where you know the the disbelief is kind of in there of did you really just do that type thing so whether it's you know like a classic monsters or it, you know anything else that's out there uh we'll actually go ahead and start off with the the crafting gamer hmm the thing is with the thing with that is is I never really thought about the difference between a supernatural and a supernatural horror in my games. It's like it it's scary, it's scary. If it's not, it's not. So but I will have to say for uh if I'm really looking for any sort of theme, like a darker theme itself, I will within Palladium anyway, turn to the um Beyond the Supernatural book because it's random character generation for the, the the nightkin or whatever the heck they're called are it's just great for you want something scary roll that up you will have are, something are that'll you referring make to the night breed whatever are you heck talking about up. night breed night Crafting? Uh, night breed yeah i believe so the the, the, the night spawn i don't believe it's called night breed but uh the humans with the dark powers at any rate Night Bane. Night Bane. That's what it was. We'll eventually get to the right name. Trust us. We can do this. Yeah. Or I was looking for my. I was looking for my book, and I think it's downstairs. So. I, I was. I was hitting all the fucking holes, and that damn gopher, that mole, was kept ducking it like Ted Ted Kennedy up until what twenty fifteen. <laughs> God was trying to stack his name for you. periodically. And Nightbreed was just on YouTube uh, movies for free uh, a while back. <laughs> now they've rotated over uh, the one with the L.A. Law guy. I can't think of the name of it. Oh, I'll be right back, guys. Uh oh, his wind chimes are going off. <laughs> that's a that's a pretty good answer, Crafting Gamer. And I would like to also interject real quick. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we did have a lineup change. Crafting Gamer is now a regular member here with us on, at least in the foreseeable future, at Table Breakers. I don't know how long I'm going to be alive. So, anyway, I'd like everybody to give Mr. The Crafting Gamer a warm, hearty welcome. And uh, appreciate any benefits or any uh, any uh, congru con uh, gratuities that are going to The Crafting Gamer. Please get in touch with him. We will have the man of the Abacus there to help wire that directly to his box. Hello, Flady. Yep. All right. What a uh, Connell's got. Uh, uh, Jay, what about you? Yeah. Can you um, state the question or put it into Discord so I can kind of mull it over my my thoughts there? Uh, basically, the you know. What are some of the common supernatural creatures that you'd like to pull into your game? I guess is the best way to kind of... Okay. That are not necessarily horror? Or okay. that are horror? Okay, that are not necessarily that, that horror. Can, that, that can or cannot be. It, it, it's... I um, think it's a dealer's choice. So if I am not going for the horror vibe, uh, the supernatural creatures I generally will use... Um, if I'm going for a more mysterious vibe are probably doppelgangers um, only because they can be anything, anyone that the PCs talk to and the PCs may be none the wiser at any given point. 
Um, you know, and those doppelgangers, you know, they might be trading information to the, to a doppelganger. They won't know. Uh, so the doppelganger might be the final foe of the evening or the session. Um, and they've been giving away their entire hand the entire time. So, you know, if if they've been, you know, working up all the clues of, as to, you know, solve a murder and um, they've been working side by side with this NPC and that NPC has been working against them. Suddenly, you know, they get to the final encounter and they're like, I don't understand why this guy keeps countering us. I don't understand why this guy knows everything about us, but we know nothing about this person, about this person we're fighting. Um, you know, when they finally defeat the guy and it's revealed that it was a doppelganger all along, then they're like, oh, geez, who are we talking to all this time? Who did we tell all of our secrets to? Who did we tell of our strategies to? Uh, and it starts making them think, you know, for future games uh, or future sessions, especially, you know, should we be giving all of our hand away? You know, especially if we might potentially be talking to an enemy in disguise. Okay. Bruce, what about you? In my in my games that I like to run, I, I typically will use supernatural elements without bringing in supernatural horror. Also, uh, Pathfinder is really not a good system to run horror because of the fact that, like, a lot of times when you create a character, there's these extraneous rolling methods to have to make a character that's not completely average. And what I'm saying is that, like, we no longer do the 3D6 as they fall the way down. We, we don't do that. That's just not something we do. So whenever I'm using Supernatural in a, a typical Saturday game, I usually do not have a, a horror element attached to it because... Uh, your reflex save or your will save will prevent you from suffering negative effects. Even though in Pathfinder they, they do have things called haunts, which we discussed at length before on this and other channels, um, I don't feel that it's really a good system to run horror with. But I will use the supernatural elements in it, like, you know, psionics or magic. So the, you might be feeling like you're dealing with some sort of morality behind the screens, like what Jade just described. And he's pretty much trying to play you five or six moves ahead and you're unaware of how he's doing it. it. It's neat if you can do that, if you can pull it off, that's amazing. And it's hard. Uh, you, you can do it, but as a, as a dungeon master or as a referee or as a storyteller, you have to have a game that allows you as a GM to do multiple story arcs and allow you to have a setup meets or have uh, various information for NPCs at certain times because otherwise, like a lot of Pathfinder players will try to cut the head off the snake. They'll try to immediately jump to the big bad guy at the end of the level, at the end of the dungeon, you know, like, oh, just get my summoner within 30 feet of him and he's going to drop Ivar's black tentacles and summon like five or six dread shadows and no more bad guy. You know, well, okay, fine, whatever. But you usually don't want to try to do that with Pathfinder uh, supernatural horror works with certain systems really well. Yeah, I'll, I don't know. Uh, I, I I like having my uh, my enemies covered with uh, circle protection against good when it comes to summons. Circle protection against good. Circle of uh, protection against law. Um, you have uh, remember the old artifact amulet of non detection. Yep. Yeah, I like that. Um, mm -hmm. I just I just like those things and having having if if you've got that if you if you're covering your bases for your NPCs that much, your players will start to cry foul after the third or fourth little boss bad guy they fight and they're like, really? why can't we find this guy? He keeps dropping these these little mini bosses at us, so we barely survive. We need to take the head off the snake and they they will overreach and they'll do something like I'm going to jump through this portal and then they get half the party killed because there's a giant blue dragon there that just belches lightning and you have fun with things like that and you talk about it for two years. And then, you know, if you do things like that, your players kind of get feel like, oh, Bruce, you're just a killer DM and you, you just want nothing more than to puppeteer us and control us and there's no real story here. You, it, it, we got to run through all these stupid little hoops in linear fashion. And you're like, no, 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 no. Here's all the hexes of what you have yet to explore. Go for it. 
and they're like, no, that's not the game we want to play. What do you want to do? And they do nothing. So you're like, fuck you. I'm going to start a war, and uh, you guys get to deal with an invasion because you guys want to drag your feet too much. But for me, and I, this is one of my caveats about having a game where you have high fantasy or power fantasy, doing supernatural horror in them is very hard. The only way you really can get away with supernatural horror in a game like Pathfinder is to have something happen to where somebody loses control of one of their uber menches, and that is where the game can really shine. Because if you are able to rip the magician or rip the wizard or rip the cleric out of the player's control and make him start doing things nefariously against the party's interests, against you know direct damage on, on the party itself, like, yeah, they'll, they'll mob them, they'll, they'll smash the guy, they'll kill him and they'll resurrect him if they can heal him. But if, if you have things that twist and warp and, and distort the good events and the good effects the party has done, that's what you really want to get into more than trying to overcome a high armor class or a high will save or things like that. You'll have a lot more benefits if you can start working on the minds of the people around the party and making them to seem like the bad guys or making them seem like outsiders when they've been part of this at land and they were born in that town three miles away. And if you can convert the mindset of all the people around them, that makes for a more interesting game as it, you know, now if they have to set up a fight against public opinion, it's easy for them to swing a sword. Now they have to figure out how to get their bard or paladin out there and be a good face and try to sway public opinion back in their favor. And that sounds like a political game, but actually it's a very effective horror game because if you remember right back in the old days, if the party, if the town didn't like you, they came to your tower with pitches or with, with uh, pitchforks and torches. And you could do that. Go ahead, Jade. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'd like to caveat off of uh, something you said there about, um, you know, supernatural horror or supernatural fighting um, in Pathfinder. And the fact that you would try to get either the mage or the cleric or somebody to act against the party's interests, there are some really great spells that allow for that. One of them is uh, Magic Jar, and you don't even have to hit them with Magic Jar during a main fight. You can hit them with a Magic Jar in the entry hallway. And if nobody's none the wiser, you know, if the wizard doesn't understand what happened or the cleric doesn't understand what happened from the very get go, and you tell you pass you know information you know covertly to that player if they're a player who you know is willing to to go along with this you know you might have on your hands a betrayal at you know house on the hill situation where you know one of the players characters is working counter to the party um and the party has to figure it out along the way like there are loads of ways of doing this especially in pathfinder um but you have to have the, the the right kinds of players who would be willing to play along with that. Yeah, that that that's not going to be my table. I I love my guys, but I tell you what they love to do, and that is like, mm -hmm. nope, we're not going along with anything Bruce is doing at all. Nope, nope, <laughs> nope. Yeah. Okay. Discovered that from the by watching. Hi, what about you? Honestly, because of the fact that I run. Uh, I, yeah, I can do cosmic horror, but I kind of like um, existential horror a whole lot more. And so you'll see me often running around with I, with your bog standard vampire and werewolf, but because of the fact that I have a lot of experience dealing with World of Darkness. So, and specifically, I play Elysium level games because I prefer Elysium over um, standard um, neonate running around 13th gen garbage, I, garbage can um, characters. I, I like the idea of thinking along because you're dealing with at that point an ancient evil who's been around for and not even evil because of the fact that it, it could be a curse but you know you're dealing with the pet with all the paths of and yes I will I, I will port the concepts of this over to because honestly you don't need to worry about generations or or any of the other garbage that goes along with the idea of playing world of darkness I love world of darkness but not in Pathfinder or not in a DD and d game but the concept, of, the concept of you're an eternal being who's been around for centuries, you're not, sorry, you're not going to go pull Bram Stoker's Dracula because, you know, you you got a hard-on for some girl you found and you decided to get bored and take a, take a boat trip to England. 
um, no, if I'm if the party moves into a city and you know the person who runs it is an actual vampire, it's not welcome to Curse of Strahd. It's going to be a whole lot of a much different game you're going to be playing, and you're going to be up against somebody who's a few you know they've had a even decades of time to dig in, build you know build resources, build assets, and they're going to probably be approachable if they're if they're not anarchs or you know some kind of I want to control all of human you know some kind of horrifying sabbat based character. But if you're dealing with a cam or or a dark ages vampire, which is guess what we're mostly playing dark ages, and you're looking for a dark ages Elysium game, and so your standard adventurer is going to come in there and you're going to start dealing with problems, and the problems are going to be there. I mean. It's going to it's going to feel like a very political game but then again if you're a a storyteller player politics is kind of part and partial with part and parcel with with what you're going to do for the actual game itself and so you're just going to have to just enjoy the idea that they've got an agenda you might not be part of that agenda you might be in the way of the agenda they might want you sorry i heard a whistle um, yeah, my phone. Sorry, no problem. Um, but I said, they have an agenda. You're part that, that. You're just part of it. And so, like I said, you're you're going to encounter that. You're going to encounter a, like liches. Like everyone's like liches are big scary things. And yeah, but they also operate on a timetable and in a world far different from yours, from your measly sub century long lifespan. And on top of that, you're measly sub I uh, sub decade campaign length so you know if you're going to encounter a lich or an entire an entire clutch of liches who are operating they're going to be operating different from you it's gonna be aliens we be kind of horrible and terrifying yeah I'm going like yeah I'm gonna deal with banshees or other forms of uh, of other like I know that people are like I, I know currently a big thing right now is you know the mind flayer which is just well, welcome to Cthulhu star spawn um and you're like it's just like their agendas are far different from yours like you won't understand like, what they're doing seems terrifying but to them it just stands it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a tuesday yeah tuesday but i said but for you it's horrifying like wait you're raising an entire town just so that way you can suck out their life force periodically well like, yeah I mean, well, what would you do if you were in some situation? And then you had the wizard in the party going, oh, yeah, I kind of would do the exact same thing, at which point he gets smacked by the paladin and cleric going, no, we don't do that. I mean, you don't do that. Stop. Okay, 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 I'm going to be good. And it's like, or you start introducing ideas of maybe, and it's a great way to enter, like, that horrible thing, that horrible thing that's driving the vampire or the werewolf clan or the lich to start you know or the mummy you've encountered they're doing something but because you're like oh we gotta fight them they're evil bad guys until you start finding out that maybe they're preparing for something far more terrifying than them and something more horrifying and but like do you have like do you stop at the you know at the lich you're sitting here going Guys, you can't stop me. I need to complete this dark ritual. Yes, I'm sacrificing 20,000 people to power this spell, but you don't want to see what comes after. When I, If I fail at this, if I don't sacrifice 20,000, what, what comes later will be worse. And But, you know, the paladin, mm, you know, if you get some certain people who are like, uh, all evil must smash mash with hammer must do good uh, I must do good brain dead uh we all know certain people who are like that um you won't get to understand like at that point you're starting to push the players to compromise their virtues compromise their I their ideals because they because if one person stops to ask wait why are you sacrificing and in the, in the lich wait you're actually going to listen to me explain it Yes. Okay. And then suddenly the player, the players go, maybe we might actually want to sacrifice 20. Um, do you need high level people or just commoners? And I've actually had a player stop when he actually asked the evil villain, 
what his plan was in the evil villain explains the whole plan and he's like um can you get by with just commoners and the villain uh i need people of this quality um i'll get back to you and then he wanders off and because and like, now he's complicit in, in what would what would be a standard you're an evil campaign now because you know when you find out that the eldric abomination is actually more terrified of a bigger scarier eld eldric, eldric horror and now you're starting to go you know what i said i'm lawful good and technically i'm still lawful good i'm protecting the rat like now you're starting to, start to, to slide towards lawful evil you're trying to slide down that um you, you know you're the path of kings or the path of humanity now you know you're you're compromising your virtues. You know, you're heading for that limit break and I'm pushing you towards it. And I want you to compromise like that. And that's kind of how I would use horror, like a common common horror tropes in, in every day without being officially horror, but still being horror. Uh, Connell, we did uh, bypass you because you had uh, your phone. I, so my daughter know. called. Sorry, I had to do okay. to be a dad for a minute. Okay. What, what about for you? What What are some of the... Uh, common uh, supernatural type things that you bring into it. Uh, I like the Fey. I, I, it's not that I don't appreciate a good story involving vampires, zombies, and all that, but I like the Fey. The Fey have this unique throughout the history of man. They've had multiple different names. If you need a good source in Fey horror. Uh, Go read your Eastern European mythology. I'm talking. I, I'm talking about the one and the only Baba Yaga, who has made appearance on this show uh, last Christmas when I did my one shot. But if you use Fae correctly, there are a whole lot more terrifying than uh, werewolves, vampires, so forth and so on. Not saying that those other creatures don't have their Place because they do. I mean, the Fae might be responsible for poor old Timmy turning into a Lugaroo, which is horrifying for everybody. Here, here's a bone. Click. There goes Leash. Bye, Timmy. As now the Lugaroo is tearing through town after town, and it just happens to be in a small uh, village in France, and you get the Beast, uh, which was, if you look in your history, look into. That anyways, 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 I'm getting excited about this. How dare I get excited about something? Um, but stealing children, or stealing uh, stealing children and placing them with shape cha uh, shape changers, shifters, not shifters, uh, shape shifters, is more terrifying to somebody's psyche than ooh look, there's a big he, he, I come to suck your blood. Thank you, Edwards. Uh, go back to. Washington State, you twinkling little bastard. Um, so that's how I use Supernatural. I, I like getting into the mythology, the things that keep us up at night. You know, we spend more money to keep the lights on worldwide than we do anything else. Because in our subconscious, I'm kind of quoting from a book, and most of us know what book I'm talking about. But subconsciously, the dark still scares us. And there's a reason why. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree with Connell here. I, I tend to use the Fey, even even through and to using like uh, the, the Fey courts, because there's nothing, you know, scarier than, you know, you, you all of a sudden transport your party into the Fey realms, and then there's Nab standing right in front of them, and everyone's going, oh, crap. But another another great one I like to use is actually the puck. He's actually oh. amazing to use also, just because he's not he 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 kind of bounces in between and he's got he's his own own brand there. Yeah, so. uh, dear Shakespeare, how do we miss thy with our story yeah. of Midsummer Night to haunt our dreams? Yes. yes. All right. So uh, this next one, we'll go ahead and start with Connell on. Uh, what are some key elements that uh, that make a a horror tabletop game successful for you? Um, I said this last night, and I uh, I'll say it again because I fully fully believe this. It's sound. There's a lot of situations where you can't control the lighting at the table if you're working at a shop, or for whatever reason, uh, you uh, for you just can't control the light. But sound. 
even for the DM, listen to music, listen to whatever that will get your mind right in that seat, sweet spot that will, when you sit at the table and everybody else, your inner uh, Vincent Price shows up, your uh, Crypt Keeper, your use your medium of choice. And when they sit down at the table, have music in the background, maybe a soft violin, haunting violin song in the background. It's not a big thing, it's not a small thing, but it's a thing that they'll hear in the background. Or, and I said this again last night, when you're about ready to see the big bad and he just happens to be a cult leader uh, playing the opera song uh fortuna oh which is, fortuna. oh yeah which is honestly a it's a drinking song that a bunch of monks came up with it's not the antichrist it's about drinking but the way it has been displayed in social in uh, modern media it makes it horrifyingly more yeah, suspenseful. So you have that playing in the background as a party gets closer to the door. You kind of crank it up as a volume as the music is coming through the door louder and louder. And when they open the door, it goes full uh, climax, not being perverted, but the full climax of the song. And boom, there they are facing Cthulhu, facing a lich, facing whoever's running this cult. So I think music is uh is very important when it comes to running uh a good horror game because it is mentally it is a good way uh it's a good way to start uh baking building blocks for the mental torment uh torsion act that you're going to make them go through as the game continues okay i am uh, a night <laughs> Jane, what about you? Yeah, Thank so... You, um, sorry, what was your question? I, I, <laughs> what, I, I wanted, what? Before, before you get to your, your answer, you got Carmina Burana, which is exactly the answer that Connell was looking for, but he didn't know. Yeah, yeah I don't know why that. it posted so many times from because you have a, Okay, see your little icon in the chat panel area? It's clicked to all right now. You need to click it for whatever you're doing. Ah. When you click all, all, it goes, it goes to all the channels. All of them. That gotcha. one is so important, especially in this topic that we're talking. A, f a pack that repeated itself, what, five times I'm counting is amazing. I can live with it. The chat should live with it, and everybody else can go. <laughs> but okay. uh, what, what, are, what are some of the key things that for you make a tabletop? RPG successful for a horror tabletop RPG? So for horror, what makes it a success for me is um, a, a clear um, and understandable suspense. Um, you know, something that is going to add tension and keep driving that tension up and up and up. Um, you know, mystery does this really well where, you know, you have this um, suspense or this this uh, unknown and it drives tension and it drives the players forward or drives the characters forward to figure out what's going on. Uh, the same thing can be said for horror. The more driving tension you have in a uh, in a scene in a, a across multiple scenes, uh, you know, leading from one to the next. Um, you know, that that idea that we don't actually know what's out there. We don't know what's truly going on and what's working against us. We don't know why, you know, the the characters are being picked off one by one. And we were trying to not split the party anymore because we realize we're being picked off one by one. Um, you know, so so elements that, you know, isolate party members or isolate uh, the group away from everyone else um you know drive home the fact that uh their their allies may not actually be their allies um drive that tension up and keep it you know at a high pitch the entire game up into the final climax that is when you release the tension that is when you allow the pcs to you know confront this thing that has been you know driving them forward this entire time um and then once they've confronted it the tension should bleed away maybe not all at once maybe slowly 
But if it does bleed away all at once, there should be some element, something there that makes them question, did we actually succeed? Is this actually over with? You know, especially those moments where the player's like, all right, yeah, we kicked the, the big bad guy's butt. Now what? And they're like, wait, we're, we're still playing. Ga Game Master, why, why are we still playing? Why are we still in initiative? I don't know. You tell me. Why are you still in initiative? And you, you just let them try to suss out, wait, what was our goal? Was our goal actually defeating this guy or was it something else? Is this guy actually what we were supposed to defeat? Is this guy or is this, you know, this thing we defeated, is it, was that the actual mission parameters? And let them sweat it out. <laughs> Bruce. What, what Sorry, for you, was... what makes a, what makes a horror, uh, a horror game a success? What are some of the elements that make that a success for you? Um, when I properly set the stage and I narrate a scene, not or, or or narrating a combat or describing how things proceed, and one of my players will say something like, "I need to stand up for just a second. I need to not get the willies about this." That's happened a couple times uh, when I was running or in the Orient Express the second time, there's a particularly vile scene where one of the NPCs is there in the bathhouse with the players in Istanbul. And while they're there in the bathhouse, some cultists emerge with a, a stretcher and the cultists have these weird bulges in their jackets until they take their jackets off and they've got four arms. And some of the, they've, they've got arms that have been sewed onto them like Frankenstein men. And they're carrying this worthy mass of humanity, literally. And when they put the blob of things down, they pull the sheet off of it, the burlap sacks come off of it. And you realize there's a dozen children that, have, that are sitting there in shock, laying on the cold marble naked, staring at anywhere they were deposited but all the children are sewn together with wire and with a wire and thread and the host the pcs were there to see suddenly uh, an assassin comes up behind the block he's laying on and just slices his throat and an incantation goes off as the players realize they're getting ambushed and the flesh falls off said host leaving his skeleton to fall off the side of the slab and the bubbling churning mass of human flesh goes over to the children who at the end they start to scream and, and beg for mercy as the hot flesh scalds them and twists them into something ugly and misshapen and the players realize that you know they're kind of naked and in the middle of a fight letting your players have a situation by the way you know, initiative in uh, cthulhu is done as a static item, so you have the highest initiative. What are you doing? And it goes down the realm like that. And just listening to your players be like, I need a break. Before we start this combat, I need to go outside and just pet the dog for about three minutes. <laughs> and that's when you know you did it right. <laughs> mm. <clears throat> Not laughing at All you. Right. Laughing at private chat. Kai. What about for you? Uh, so, making us making us it, it successfully a, a successful horror check and seen right. Well, no. What, for you, for you, what makes a a horror game a success? What are some of the the key elements that make that a success for you? Honestly, if I can get my players to pause for a bit. For me, it's just if, if they can get into the story, I, I, into the story, into the scene. That's all I. That, that's all I want from my players is that: are they getting into it? Are they actually embracing it, or are they playing it up for complete and total laughs? I mean, are they stopping to pause to think about what's going on? If they're not, if all it is is to them is a cheesy little um, encounter, then 
that I failed, then I failed. But if they're actually getting into character, into the scene, following the, following what's going on in the setup, then I've done a good job. If they're actually worried, you know, not, you know, sometimes, I, sometimes the goal is to make them disgusted, make them sick about what's going on. Or if I get, or if I can get them angry, if I can get them fearful, that's, I'm doing my, like, I'm doing that job. So I know music's part of it. Setting the scenes part of it. Description is part of it. But if I get my players to just embrace it and, you know, they may just knowingly, you know, nod along go, okay, this is the trope. I'm following this, um, this meme. I'm following the, the, the idea. So therefore if they find it when they finally get into, this is a, I, we're actually part of a slasher flick, or this is a this is a Hellraiser inspired story, or this is an existential horror story, and they actually play along, and then and that the, the horror doesn't pull them out of character, and they start just looking at it as okay, so I need to buff up my mechanical stats in this and this. I want them to feel it as players. I want them to feel worried, to feel fear, feel feel for their, you know, for their imaginary loved ones or look for, look out for each other. So they're, uh, it, it's, that's what I'm looking for, I guess. It's not like, it's all those elements combining to create one good story is honestly what, like one good emotional effect. And I know that that one person cracking a bad joke at the wrong time can ruin the atmosphere, can ruin the magic in, but if you've done it right, they're just able to, fall into it they're you know they're able to enjoy it you know get get into the i'm playing this interesting weird character and yeah we're going into we're dealing with the realms of, you know the realms of the unseelie court today or we're going to go into you know the outer the outer reaches of malpheus go into the you know into the hells or into the afterlife we're going into a i into a blighted kingdom or we're going out into the i into the shadowlands and Fight it, you know, and we're getting ready to go fight an Akutensai. They're where they're sitting here trying to stock up on, on you know, trinkets and art on art because I've set up the horror, I the horror in the scene well enough that when they're standing on top of the Caillou wall and looking out into the Shadowlands and they're seeing the teeming masses of goblins and the demons and the and the distant green eerie glow, of the pit, it's out there, and they know that they have to go out there and patrol and go find something. They need to go find the castle that's well, that's lost out there, and they might encounter the sea, the the fields of eyeballs out there somewhere. Like I want them to feel queasy about the idea of we're getting ready to send you out to the tainted lands. Are you ready to go do it? You're adventurers, right? Yeah, I don't feel like going out there, and I want them to go. But we got to do it because after all, you're the heroes. You're the special people. You should be the, or you were the one tasked to go out there and do it. Somebody believes in you, or they're trying to dispose of you. One of the way, I, either or, you know, things happen, and I want them to walk into a situation un, you know, uneasy. I want them to. Uh, that's when it's successful. Okay, and last but not least, uh, crafting gamer. What what about for you? What what is the the mark of a successful horror game for you? Uh, well, admittedly, I don't have too much experience with horror, but I did try it once, and I think I did it quite well. But slightly irritated the than my players. What I was con what I was doing is saying, making them uh, roll for initiative just to find out whatever it was was a phantom or a feeling. It worked at first, but I think I used it just a little too much. Okay. And that's the best I got for that. I think the best experience I had was I uh, was describing this kind of human centipede scenario for an adult game. And I had a guy who's been a doctor for the last like 30, 40 years get up from the table, uh, start right back, go to the toilet, uh, go to the, the garbage can and puke. And I knew I was, I was on the right. <laughs> <laughs> the right uh, path, you know, I had a doctor. It's like, hold on one second. And uh, Ralph. Hey, if that's if that's the, the, the event you're going for, awesome. If 
but all right so uh what are some unique settings for a supernatural or horror campaign that you like to use we'll start this one with jake uh settings um no one particular setting really jumps out at me like i mean i could i could be cliche and say ravenloft or call of cthulhu um but i mean again they're they're cliche they're, that's what they're built for um you know i i do a lot of my own home brewing and home running games so there are areas within my game world that are haunted per se they they have uh, stories and legends and lore about them that uh, drive deep and horrible things that have happened in those locations. Uh, so any place that I want to use for a horror themed or a horror setting, it's going to have history. It's going to have some kind of deep seated lore that is uh, integral to why it is a horror location. Uh, and part of part of the game or part of the, the setting and, and mission is finding out also what happened there, uh, finding out that location's uh, lore or mystery. You know, why is this place so haunted? Why does nobody go here? Um, and, you know, in doing so, they find out what happened and they can start to try to piece together what they have to do to either survive what is happening to them and what is happening in that area or figure out a way to um, warn others from ever entering there because it might already be too late for them by that point. Um, or the, the third option there is they figure out a way to end what is happening and make it not so dangerous for, for everyone who wants to go there in the future. Um, which, again, you know, in my game world, anything players do is a permanent change I make to the game world. Like, I, I'm not going to run the same game multiple times. I'm going to run the next story. And if it just happens to be in the same general vicinity that other players have played in before, whatever those players did made a lasting impression on the game and a, a permanent change. Um, so they might find the warning sign that a party left before entering this this uh, valley of of mist and and death, um, they might say, you know, all ye who enter here abandon hope for survival. And the next party that comes along, and they, they see that, and like, uh, guys, I don't, I don't know if we should go there. How, how how fresh is this sign? Oh, it was there, you know, it was put there maybe a couple months ago. It, it you know, it's showing, you know, it's fairly new. Uh, yeah, I don't know if we should go in there. Or, you know, you get the one guy, he's like, no, no, that's exactly where the bandits would be. We gotta go in there. And then all hell breaks loose. And I and I just giggle because they, they have no idea. It sounds okay. like it's so, a adventure. I mean, it, and, and like I said, you know, I don't think there's any one particular setting that I would use over another horror i mean yes again you can pick the the settings that are made for it and that have it already pre-built into it um but if you can figure out how to make it your own it it makes it i think all that much more better for you and your uh your group i i, I honestly do especially if you know what you know makes what horror th genres that your players you know what really drives your players like if i know uh one of my players is um you know really uh, creeped out by i don't know snakes then you know what you. i might use snakes you. You know, hey you guys were doing it to me yesterday so um oh have i told you all time, about of spiders right um <laughs> but you know if if i know that some of my players are creeped out by i don't know um rats I'm going to add rats to the scene. Like it's, it's just going to be, you know, I'm going to make whatever setting I need available to me, you know, through my own creation and I'm going to use it because I, I, you know, it's personalized. It's tailored to the environment. It's tailored to the group. Well, see, see Connell, what you do is for Jade is you, you don't, you don't get him spiders. You get him crap. Uh, 
I actually didn't know, would he invite you over to game with him and his friends who are real, normally the people he games with outside of me are some really cool people. I'm the asshole in this situation. For those who yeah, play uh, Fable 3, it, we'll get this reference, you'll hide gnomes in the game room. So when he goes to redecorate or move her, where the fuck did that gnome come from? Damn you, Connell. Yeah, you know, you do shit like that. <laughs> No, no, he, he's allergic to seafood. That's why I say crabs. Yeah, uh, but I like seafood. Sea so I, why should I waste good seafood oh. until I can enjoy it? <laughs> All right. Uh, Bruce, what Yo. are uh, what are some interesting or unique settings that you like to use for a supernatural or a horror campaign? I would say I would go with the familiar, but twist it a little bit and make it, if you can, give it that retro coat of paint because everybody loves Stranger Things. So if you can set it back in the 90s or 80s and you can make it feel familiar and you can talk about people like you hear the song Vaseline on the radio and you're getting ready to grab a Zima and you're sitting in front of your Pentium 2 processor with your uh first reva tnt card and get ready to boot up some uh, shogo mobile armor division but instead when your modem starts to connect to the internet it says starts to scream and squeal and then you hear I, 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 I got to back and you you hear things like that maybe that it just gave away the punchline but then your computer monitor goes black and so does the rest of the power it goes out. Did you blow a fuse? And then you let people start to explore their surroundings in the dark and try to remember how their bedroom was set up. Forgot about that, didn't you? All right. Um, you take three points of subdual damage for bedpost to the, uh, the, the toes. You just jam your middle and the ring toe. Good job, oh. Al. Um, you're walking down the stairs and going into the basement. And you don't quite remember this as well as you thought you did. Your mom left the laundry hamper, left the laundry basket outside the hamper on the second step from the bottom. But because it's dark and you don't have any moonlight coming in from the basement windows, uh, Basically, if you roll natural 20, you manage to land on your feet. If not, you find yourself up against the wall, uh, bending yourself backward and taking a few points of actual damage because you fell down the stairs. And then you just like small things like that, the small incremental bits of, of pain and suffering. And then just, you know, your friend Tanya, she wants to come over. She's kind of scared about the power outage in town as well. Uh, the phones work. That's the only thing that works in the, in the house. And the next thing you know is that you've you've got your friends coming over and there's no power, there's no scanners, there's only the phones. That's it. And that's all you have. Good luck. And it's a rotary phone. Yeah, it's a rotary phone. <laughs> I like doing uh, shit like that. I like I like doing things like that. If I'm gonna be running like a Cthulhu style game. Or if I was going to run, like, say, like, index card RPG, either of those would be really, real simple to run like that. And you can just kind of throw from memory the narration of the world around you. What was popular in the 90s? Make sure you feed that back into your, your narrative loops and throw those at the, the players because you want them to have, like, small dopamine hits. And, oh, yeah, I remember that. Oh, God, I remember the smell of the strawberry frosted pop tart when it first came out of the toaster oven uh do things like that you know and then once you got them hooked into the second act then it's just real simple to start feeding them the the terrible events that are sure to follow and that's not hard to do as a dm you are already used to doing terrible things now you just have to do it to a tune to where like you can dance around whatever system and narrative you want to paint and make sure you take the familiar things like your neighbor's corgi, which is always friendly and it lays down and rolls over on his belly to show you it, it loves you. But now it's growling at you. And it doesn't look right. You know, and then like as it starts to growl, 
you see parts of its fur and skin peel back like the petals of a flower and the dog skull falls off <laughs> onto the ground while the tentacles come out of the back of the corgi. Just just do fun shit like that to your players. Just just give them like nice little vibes like ah! <laughs> Were you left alone a lot as a child there, Bruce? I, I'm just curious. No, I I, I I skipped out on the horror films until I was 40. Oh, so you're playing catch up like a madman. Gotcha. Dude, I am I am playing catch up so hard. Five yeah, tomatoes died in the stream. Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Ooh, good movie. You know, the yeah. sequel had uh, George uh, Clooney in it. And uh, their station says, bring back the pudding in the cans, damn it. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Yes! My God. Pudding. <laughs> pudding. I like pudding. Yeah, with the, uh, the, 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 and then the square pizza from, from grade school. Oh, yeah. Oh, back when, you're, oh. when your food was not actually the same food as going to a local county jail or prison. But when the, the caf, uh, cafeteria ladies actually had a degree in cooking from either home experience because they learned from their parent or their mom or their grandma or they went to school for it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go back to that. I yeah, this. Yeah. Anyways. So, Kai, what, what are some <laughs> uh, some interesting or unique uh, settings you like? for your supernatural or horror games? When I, because of the fact that I integrate uh, my, the supernatural horror is a perpetual thing that's in my game, I have like, I, I will admit that I crib from th three different sources. I crib from L5R for the Shadowlands because it's part of the world and it's a bizarre alien world and I like, and I like players walking into the, uh, you know, thinking they're big badasses and then walking into a land that slowly corrupts you and then being able to give mutations and Cronenberg levels of, of, you know, mutations and deformations that happen if you go in unpredicted, uh, unpredicted. And I don't care how powerful you are. Eventually it will warp you and you will die of, you know, die of magical corruption and cancer. And I love that. Um, I, I admit that I crib extensively from, I am from Exalted, so you will see the Fey Wilds. You will, I and not like D and D Fey Wilds, where it's like that's where the Fud Elves come from. No, this is where the further you go out into it, the less and the more reality begins to warp and dissolve, and things start to no longer make sense because that's where reality is being unmade by the Fey. And I prefer, and I love that, and. I, and I also crib from there the Land of the Dead, and where and the Realm of Malpheus, where you get to go deal with demons and other horrible spawns, and other just abominations live out that way. I, I also crib from another place where <coughs> where I I am where you go where you get to see the torturous realm where all the un I am where all the evil ha you know. Where the undead end, I, I where if you're intelligent undead and you die a second time, where you end up, you know, because you know you're not really you, and I get the I, and I, because you know, it's not really you coming back as an undead, it's something else, it's a horrible abomination, and when you kill it, where does it end up? Well, I asked that question one day and created this place, and it's and well, and I, and I created the idea, and then it made it my own, but it's fun to take to take the world you know, and then showing the warping and. The, you know, how it gets warped and twisted and you think you're the badass, but then you go out into the areas where you, I where mortals I where mortal primacy is no longer um you know king. It's you're not the I sorry, your gods don't I your gods don't travel these lands. And it's like, but I but I worship God. God is all powerful. God does not touch these plant the I these realms. I'm sorry. This I this is outside the great maker's um zone of control and now you're under something else's and when players go out into other I, I like having things from outside reality coming in and changing reality around you but and then watching the gradual um evolution and real and when players start realizing they're not all powerful even when they're at all powerful status they're not really all powerful and you've just now leveling the playing field just enough but it's still not in your favor and the closer you get to 
the sources of these disturbances, the more you're um, clinging to your little island of norm of normality. So that way, when they go back to the normal world, where everything where and where two parallel lines stay parallel lines, um, where geometry still works and life is normal, they're happy because now the colors are still normal and they're okay. And now they don't want to go out anymore because they've seen too much. And now they're just like, I'm content with my rice farm. You going to go out and do anything? It, it, no, I'm, I, I'm done. I, I'm done with that. And, and the moment my players you know, go out into the, into the wildlands and see you know, the edges of creation and then see the source code of reality and then proceed to go, I'm retiring. I'm retiring. I'm, gonna go, I'm starting a farm. I'm going to go out there and plant, I plant carrots, all, I plant carrots and potatoes. I'm not dealing with this anymore. And I love the moment when my players say to themselves, my character's seen too much, I'm done. And either ascend to an actual higher calling or become potato farmers. I prefer them to be potato farmers because that's where I want I'm like, none of you are ready for this. Go, go farm potatoes. And then that one player goes, I'm going to go do the most horrible things to in reality because I'm the only one who will. And I'm like, good. You're the one person who understands. And I, that's how I, those are like the little settings I use while in my, I, when I do horror, it's because it's just persistent. It's there. It's horrible. It's horrifying. And I want them to go there and I want them to come back. And if, and if I have one player who's sitting there popping sleeping pills all day long, cause they don't want to go to sleep, you know, can't sleep. Clowns will eat me. Um, if I could hit, get a player to say that I've done everything right. You know, that takes on a completely different meeting when you go to the, uh, down to the, uh, for the jugglos. I can't go I to sleep. The clowns will eat me. Yeah, I know. But <laughs> the gathering. Yeah. yeah. That's but a whole I, different thing. But if my players could say, can't sleep, clowns will eat me, I'm, I'm doing good. I'm doing fantastic. And cold mask, that, that, that's a good try. But no. <laughs> you know what? It was ghost behind me. I'm happy. He's happy. <laughs> Honestly, if I got ghost, I am so happy. All right. So uh, last but not least, Crafty. Start, start this, uh, Garrett, as well. Before we end tonight's show, if we could just hit those real quick. I'm going to do it right now, but I wanted to make you aware of them. Are you skipping me on this question? No. Not you, Baron. No, I started with Jade. Start with Jade. You went to Kai. Then it should be and me. I go to crafting. And then you. Oh, okay. It it looks weird. Hey, whatever. Don't screw up my process. Okay. I have a process. Okay. Okay. Uh Okay, TCG. What is the yeah. uh, what, what? What are some of the unique uh, or uh, fun little places that you uh, like to have settings for your either supernatural or horror? Uh, well, I it wasn't much of a supernatural game technically, but I did have a good horror. Um, uh, location description that I had once. Let me put that down. I'm less distracted. Uh, it was a. Well, I can give you the description right now. As you walk up, you see a dark, gloomy farm. The area around it doesn't seem touched, and yet the farm itself looks as if it has still been worked every single day. And yet there are clear signs of abandonment everywhere. As you walk up, you notice that the walls almost invite you in. The walls of the sorry, the walls of the barn almost invite you in, calling you to see what's inside. When you see what's inside, you see nothing except a trap door leading to what is clearly a man-made set of tunnels. 
and you have this strong, almost unresistible urge to go deeper and deeper. And this is where I did the whole thing where people kept getting uh, told to roll for initiative, even though there's nothing there. And like I said, I think I overused that just a little bit. But at first, that that combined with something's like popping out of the shadow at you or so you can feel something climbing up right behind you. At, well, at first, kind of gave the atmosphere I was looking for. I didn't think about I was overdoing it a little bit and hadn't really tried that hard for a good horse theme afterwards. Okay. You know, see, like myself, what I like to do is to, you know, put them kind of into the, the, the seat of, you know, kind of like what Bruce was saying, you know, you know make them feel all warm and fuzzy everything's going to be great. You know, they, they come to expect, oh, yeah, this is just going to be a normal game. We're going to be fighting, you know, you know first level orcs and, and, you know, maybe some goblins and kobolds and all of a sudden they're, they're facing, you know, all kinds of unusual fey and, you know, they, they are, you know, get transported into you know the Fey Wilds, uh, kind of, kind of. If you want to think about it, I I use the Fey Wilds very similarly to uh, how they do in uh, Exalted, where it is completely backwards. Uh, you're, you're walking, you see after images of things that maybe have happened, maybe have never happened. You just don't know. Because that right there is enough to make people sit and actually start worrying about their own sanity. You know, if you can, if you can, you know, paint a picture to where even the players are going, wait, what? You know, they, they, they may see themselves doing horrendous acts and what's beautiful is nine times out of ten by the time you get to the end of it they are doing those horrendous acts because of just the way that the fey wilds are uh so connell the last one on this uh wh what are some of the unique or fun places you like to have your your uh supernatural horror games um, I like, I, depending on the crowd, I, I think, uh, child support court is a nice place to store more, most horror games. Um, <laughs> so you go for the more psychological horror. God. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, granted that is a horror show all by financial itself. Financial horror. Yeah. Financial horror. Um, <laughs> the you Hall know. of Lost. Meanwhile, <laughs> um, in, in the Hall of Justice. I just depends on the group. I mean, I DM for kids, and I also great, uh, DM for uh, adults. And when it's adults, I know it's an old trope, but I'll, I like the concept of the woods, especially, uh, let's say, the Black Woods of uh, Eastern Europe, you know. The darker the better. With all, we're all most. I mean, there is somebody. I think somebody in this panel uh, brought up to me where most mythology, uh, not most mythology, most of the fairy tales that we have today started in India, and, and it just migrated its way through uh, uh, Eastern and Western Europe. But I like I like the woods. I, there's you can do a lot of spooky shit in the woods, uh, especially when it comes to campaign. If you want to use uh werewolves or the fae or anything of that nature um i also like i like using churches um because when you go to a church in character or now character oh it's a church it's holy ground this is supposed to be the place where you know uh, evil shall not you know break the seal of thy entry and well if the church is haunted what if there was just some horrible shit has been done in the name of the greater good in that church? The greater good. So I, I like to. Yes. I, I tend to go with the more campy was just because you can do a lot with the Fae and Will O Wisp and other things of that nature. 
or somewhere that they think that because they th uh, this is a symbol of hope, peace, love, and life, and tilt it just enough on a, a, its ear where it's a, a great big smack in the face. Oh crap! Did not see that coming. Um, just be you know, just because the minister is smiling at you doesn't mean he's a good man. Uh, and I'm Catholic, so that says a lot. Um, <laughs> dear Father, all in, anyways, um, <laughs> I'll get back. To, I'll do my rosaries later on. Um, a lot of them, but I like to put if it's a serious game, all joking aside, if it's a serious game, I don't want to have the players already assume that this is going to be ha Halloween theme. I want them just to slowly walk into the trap and once they hit the trigger, door slams behind them and welcome to Five Nights at Freddy. It, it is just bam, bam, boom. What's up, Kai? So do you have some NPCs off screen going, okay, who I who had fa I, I, I fairy invasion in the woods? All right, all right. Well, the, okay. cabin, uh, the Cabin in the Woods is my favorite movie just because it, it's a weird movie, but if you look at it from a DM's point of view, that's kind of, kind of weird. <laughs> what you're describing is perfect. A bunch of players go out into a dark woods and something terrible happens. Meanwhile, somewhere there's an NPC, talking to other NPCs, like, all right, who had, uh, I, I, who had, you know, at the real fairies who are um, Catholic and uh, I Catholic inspired, um, sanitation had it. Well, shit. I'll give them the pool. Get out the pool. Now your job is to kill them. Just remember, don't don't fail. Or the world ends. Kill your players. That, that cabin yeah. right there has yes. in memes. It's inspired so many conversations. Uh, if you know of the cabin and what movie it is. You're in great company because those movies only got better. And the TV series that was on Stars was amazing with Bruce the fucking man Campbell. But yep. yes. like I said great. before, there's a reason why people are afraid of the dark. Uh, uh, it's a primal fear. And if you could feed, out, feed on that thing and just ramp it, you know, keep ramping it up, you know, you're and you... <laughs> Making sure everybody enjoys themselves at the end of the night is always important. But for a Halloween themed game, you need to brace the inner darkness and just drive them up against the wall and scare the shit out of them. I mean, I, I kind of feel bad. I did make a cake go pee pee in his pants, but you know, he said he had a good time the next day. So, you know, this and, is why and we don't can't forget, have nice you know, things, Connell. What? Yeah. This is why we can't have nice things. Oh, yeah. Well, it wasn't my... Yeah, yeah. Anyways, what were we going to say, Jade? Uh, I was going to say, you know, don't forget, you know, whatever, you know, horror-themed setting or, or environment you have, you you as the game master set the rules of the world. You are the god of the world. You know, you, you set the parameters by which things move. So, torch, you know, torches or flashlights... Um, you know, in, in the, the play area, they don't, their light doesn't reach as far because of an oppressive darkness. Um, you know, certain spells don't act the way they're, they're meant to, um, you know, just because it, it's a, you know, third level healing spell doesn't necessarily mean it gives third level healing. Um, you know, there, there could be uh, effects in the world that your players are fighting against that are just as much, you know, against them as the enemy NPCs or even the, uh, the, the story itself. Like do, do things that your players aren't expecting with the environment to use the environment against them you know yes sure make opportunities for them to attempt to use the environment against their foes or against you know their, to their advantage but at the same time you know if if a healing spell doesn't work as well in oppressive in this oppressive darkness maybe necromancy spells do maybe they they pack a bigger punch uh maybe certain um uh, supernatural powers might uh you know increase in, in their ability to harm something um you know so whatever setting or area that you set your play up in 
you know, go the extra mile, you know, and it doesn't even have to be out of the book. Like you don't have to use anything that isn't in the book. You, you can go like, you know what? I'm really feeling like this haunted mansion torches only shine 10 feet out around the, the, the player instead of the normal 30, you know, the dark vision, um, you know, only goes so far, you know, low light vision stops at, you know, five feet beyond the torch, um, you know, in, in this one area because of whatever uh, haunt or supernatural effect that is happening here is, is, you know, has has taken hold or root here until the players figure out how to lift whatever that is. I, I was sort of thinking about what Kai said about the inappropriate joke at the right time. And I, I, I mentioned this last night on uh, uh, Gatekeepers. It's all right. Well, it depends on the situation. But if the players are, you're doing your haunted uh, mansion or whatever, and the attention level is, it is choking. It is choking the room by how thick it is. You got one guy that's normally me. They'll make a smart ass comment just to break the attention. It is a, uh, it, you know, it, it, their mind has needed to hit the reset button as hard as it could and as fast as it could. In my opinion, don't go too hard on this guy or that person, if male or female, because subconsciously they had to find a way to break the tension because it is, you know, thick. It's it's choking the room. And so, but if you get some smart ass as just being an asshole who is making jokes of everything, you know, this was even be me when I was younger. Get them the fuck out of your table. You're, you'll have a better game without them. Uh, I've had, I've had a lot of good DMs be patient with me, but I wouldn't put up with my humor. Well, I put up with my humor all the time, but me as a te- as younger, it's completely different. Know your players, know your table know what you want at your table and if you have to set up a, a different table for certain players set up a different table for other for those other players who aren't going to take the game seriously um i was thinking about this and i say Faye. we mean you both baron have said Faye. but have we really given any examples other than changelings well i I mentioned the courts in, in well, the, the courts. So, yeah. yeah. What, what Kai? I did too. So, all right. I'm thinking well, red caps. Well, the thing is, is that, I mean, it, it, depending on how you want to look at it, even to some point, uh, even werewolves and vampires at one point were also considered to be in some of the, text a type of thing you know they you know it it depends on which doctrine i guess is the best way to put it uh, that you bring your faith from uh or which stories you bring your faith from so i mean it you know it could you know it it it, it's a big dependence on that right I'm just imagining a group of people thinking, oh, there's a gnome village close by. Wait, those are not gnomes. Why is there that caps red? Oh, God, they're dripping with something. Oh, God, it's Papa Smurf and he's gone crazy. <laughs> All right. So uh, this one is going for Bruce uh, to start off. Uh, how can a game master create a sense of dread or suspense in their horror game? Best way I would do that is that I wouldn't be talking about anything in a hopeful sing song voice. Best way I would do that is I would revisit the initial setting on the Slumbering Czar saga, which the players ride into that miserable, ashy, dust in town, dusted town, and there's like the 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 crunch of the bones of the dead have long silenced. It's just now your plodding boots and the the hoof prints of the horses which are barely registering 45 decibels as you get into the town like you would see that majority of all these businesses and locations are all mud encrusted and and horribly built you see that the inn 
what looks to be an inn is got the last wagon that probably has scenes in this town. It's part of the structure on the outside. And there's two gnomes that are slicing up carrots and garlic and putting it into a stew pot. You can smell a little bit of meat coming all the way over here. And let the players just kind of digest that for a second. And then say across the town square, you can see they do have a a mud church. Looks like uh, dedication is some sort of fetid god. Maybe it's Nurgle. And along the avenue to the left that goes around the town square and the well at the center of the town, you can see that there's a apothecary uh, building that looks like now, all these are made of mud and, and bits of wood and, and other haphazard items. But appears to, whatever they could find, they used. It looks like there's a stables to your left-hand side, but there's no sign of horses that have been alive there for at least two or three years. There seems to be some men in leather armor that are sharpening their weapons, looking at you, but... They're not making any overt movements to get up real quick and charge you out of town. The only thing you hear, though, is the constant droning on of the wind and the, the bitter taste that it leaves on your tongue. And it, it reminds you of loss. This entire town is a lost cause. And just keep bringing up negative connotations within your narrative tone slow your speaking down try to do it at least competently to where you feel like you're feeding the players bits of information and to the point where you can almost see them trying to reach out and grab the information out of you and be like tell me what's going on here get them to that point but when you're saying things you don't want to give them any illusion that the cloudy sky above is going to clear anytime soon you want them to feel the malaise. You want them to feel the grime. You want to see come your, some of your players, if you're at an all-male group especially, you're going to see some of them reaching over and like literally itching their junk because they can feel the sand particles between their testicles and thighs. And it's not something that is a pleasant experience. You want them to, to have the want of a good dinner the taste of a good ale, but look around this entire facility, those eight buildings that's here, the guy that's hanging by the, the gallows off to the side of the well. There was no happy ending for him, and you don't think if you stay around here too long, there's going to be a happy ending for you either. Kai. Uh, You're muted. Oh, thank you. But how, how to sell the atmosphere? Is that, is that the well, question? The, how, how as game masters can you create that sense of dread and suspense uh, in your horror game? Honestly, the first step usually comes down to you just start describing everything normally like you would normally. And then you just start to slip slip details in and like you would because and you're you're counting on your players not paying attention at first because let's be honest they don't and you you slip them in slowly let each detail that you each change you've been making make it gradual and let the i know this is this is the you know how to make a longer turn campaign work, but yeah, it's, I, and eventually your players will start picking up on the things just aren't right. You know, smiles are a little bit different, you know, a little bit wider people, you know, make the thing that they're used to seem off and they slowly start to realize that something's wrong. If you just ambush them straight out of the, you know, straight out of the, the gate, you know, here you are wandering through the, frozen north and suddenly you know a bad thing jumps out and goes boo scare shock monster if you, you roll initiative no it's more it's more fun to go 
Now you're trudging through the wilderness and you find a burnt out camp. There's a dog. It's hungry. You want to take it in, right? Well, yes, dog. I want to take it in. And now you got the entry, the, the entry that you now can bring in something more terrifying. If you know the reference, yes. Um, Does that dog speak Norwegian? Eventually, yes. <laughs> Wait, Wait, so like does the people. dog or or the dog get shot and then the guy goes crazy? Hey, I feel however like however you want to run it. I feel like I should know this one. That's just an example of how you can make a make the horror feel right. Because they did that movie fantastically. You didn't realize, like, yeah, you knew it's a horror thing, but you didn't know the entry vector for the horror. You know, if you walk in and everything's crazy, well, you assume crazy. But if you walk, in, but if you walk in and you find out that ah, minor details, you know, if but you got to make sure that they don't pick it up immediately. So if you say I'm setting up a scene where I want to have a rakasha, a rakasha, you know, being the villain, um. I'm going to give a perception check. I'm not going to immediately, because how often do you guys check, look at people's hands? Well, uh, you're not going to immediately realize when you're talking to somebody and they had their fingers, you know, laced together. Are you really paying attention to, is their thumbs on backwards? And at which point someone's like, well, I would pay attention to I'm like, are you really? And most people, no, not really, because most people are fucking weirdos and stare at people's other, uh, look, look at look like people directly in the eyes of their like, I'm staring into your eyes. I no, thank you. But you know, you might have that one guy who goes, I hate eye contact. I look around the, around the room. He might pick it up, but you know that, that one guy, I'm looking intently into their eyes, staring like a fucking extrovert who's a, who's asserting dominance. Fuck that guy. He won't notice because he's too busy trying to assert dominance of the situation. But you know, the other person goes. Hey, what's wrong here? And he goes, I should probably, you know, not comment and later on start putting together pieces. But, you know, or, you know, weird shit happens. You know, you don't always have to have, you enter the room and you see a bunch of weird cabbages on the floor. Do you investigate? Um, no. No, I don't. I leave the room <laughs> as fast as possible. Yeah. Okay. I, it, what was that? You say look at people's hands. If they're a woman, I'm always looking to see if they have a wedding band on. So sometimes hey. I do pay attention to things like that. Right. But everyone's a little different. Everyone acts differently, you know, differently. So that's why I, there's that perception check of. Oh, yeah. No, I, I agree. I'm just. <laughs> and, well, now like we know why stuff. Connell goes for married women. He's attracted to the shiny. Yeah. But the thing is, that's all about what it is, is that you got to start lacing in the deep. The details you got to work up the horror rather than just simply ambushing them because you know it's like or it's like you go to sleep oh you wake up mm. and like you wake up the rest of the party oh no no rest of you, like rest of you shut the fuck up you're not here you're not here right now but he woke up yeah i know and then you get to run a dream sequence and now you think i go oh shit it's freddy krueger time or you know hey you're in a house things sound wrong oh wait play some do you play the do you play the scary music? No, because then then you break the tension of well, well now I now I hear the sound, I now I hear the music, now I know what's going on. No, you want to put them in that situation. You want them you you want them to grow into the I to feel the horror. If you're running, you know, you know, Evil Dead, you know, an Evil Dead story game, you don't play Evil Dead theme music. You don't and you don't throw the Necronomicon right in their face. I, you don't know, like, if I'm playing the thing, I'm not going to show the monster immediately. If I'm going to have, you know, some, if I'm going to run aliens, I'm not going to do certain things. You got to make sure that, that, that they feel like they're not in control. And that's the biggest thing about horror. The players lose agency without really losing agency because at any point they could just leave. But that's when they find out that the car, you know, Hey, I need you. I need you to watch over this. Uh, I, I this this hotel in the mountains. Oh, hey, the car don't work no more. Wait, what? Uh, and other weird shits are happening. That's the thing. Like you got to make sure that they go in willingly, without realizing they're about to walk into horror. And then you got to make sure that the horror builds right. 
You know, they ha- play into their curiosity. Give them a cube to play with. Give them something that, you know, let them let them open the door themselves into something terrible. Like, don't trap them until they've willfully walked into it. But don't all, but also don't, you know, don't have it be a bulldozer that just, you know, you walk into the room, slam door, 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 door. Now you're, now you're stuck, assholes. Now you have to play the horror game. No, let them walk in properly. Let, but this again, this all comes down to, have you watched a lot of horror stories? Yes. Now, mind you, if you, if you're really into fuck with your players, you know, you could always just start with y'all went to sleep and you wake up chained to, I, y'all wake up chained to various parts of the wall in a room and there's a, t- it, you know, and the magic bell starts telling you, I would like to play a game. And now you're all going, well, half was are dead. <laughs> and you know, that's a whole different experience. But then again, you can also run a hostile level of horror where you're in a happy town, but things start going wrong. And now you're trying to not get killed. It's one of the, it's all about trying to you know, know the horror. I know the genre of horror that you want to run, know, know the beats, but then re- rewrite the story in a way that it's not the, the players are not the ones watching the horror. The players are the ones who are in the middle of it. So you got to rewrite how all the, how you angle the story, how you tell it. So that way, play into their own desires. If you have a player who's a womanizing alcoholic, well, that's really easy to lure a player into into a murder into a murder game that's like that's like hostile. That's fucking simple. If you got a player who loves being a complete tool to everybody, you know, a complete bastard, I know, bastard to the nines. Congratulations. That is that is saw. Right the fuck there. If you got a, a wizard who loves to play with, you know, with the secrets of the universe, that's that's Hellraiser. If you got a, I, if you got a, a cleric who's praying to the wrong gods, congratulations. Also, Hellraiser could be Freddy Krueger. I mean, fuck, it. go with like play into tailor the horror to fit the players you're about to murder and let. And know who is going to be the la- the the last survivor because there's always a last survivor. And then look at everybody else in the party as the people you murder, maim, kidnap, or do terrible things to to aim the horror at the tar- at the target, the player you want to abuse. And you have to pick that one person because you you can't cast an omni horror. Unless you're going to go for like military, you know, military, you know, like I, I, unless you're going for a, a, you know, brutal war scene, but that's different kind of horror right there. That's just fucking brutality. But if you're like, if you're able find the player, you want to be the one that is going to be the interesting person and aim and aim it and then treat everybody else as well, the, the slut, the jock, the nerd, and <laughs> The people you get caught along the way. Okay, and uh, uh, TCG, what about for you? What? Uh, how can? How, how do you, as a game master, uh, create that sense of dread uh, and/or suspense in your heart horror yeah. game? Well, what I did, it wasn't directly a horror game, but it was definitely one where I wanted suspense and it would still work for a horror. It, it falls on the category of what Kai was talking about is making certain people disappear before the right target does. I'm not, especially when I was a teenager, not the biggest fan of purposely killing NPCs. Like, oh, I'm going to kill off all the, I mean, all the NPCs, the PCs, just to mess with this one player. So for this, I brought a lot of NPCs, but they didn't notice that they were, the players were so preoccupied with, being players they did not notice that people were going missing i even listed off the count every every time the the players like supposedly counted them people were going missing and they didn't notice it for three days then all of a sudden there one of the uh, players noticed something just before somebody disappeared which started a whole what the hell is going on and that's when the 
I uh, pulled a definitely a more of an alien thing where it was the free the disappears started happening more frequently until it was just the players left and they weren't very happy with that idea because all of a sudden like I I because palladium level one farmer isn't a level one farmer he's I mean yeah he is but he's not level one he's going to be decent power like you know not anywhere near the fighter but it, to make an entire farm of people just disappear over the course of about a week players players were, little, were actually a little freaked out about that they were like what the hell's going on what, what could have done this none of us seen this i mean we started after the first after the third day when the person started noticing they started taking patrols never seen a thing just little glimpses of shadows and maybe some movement so uh, i i like building it up with a bunch of Hopefully, at first, not noticeable, but definitely build up to where the fuck is everybody moments. Okay. Connell, what about you? What was the question? Oh, uh, yeah. How do, you as, how do you as a game master create dread or suspense in your horror game? Consequences. Let's go back to uh, I Run Rise of the Rune Lord. You got a bunch of play uh, for Pathfinder First Edition. You got a bunch of players thinking they're Billy really Badasses. Everybody's thinking they're Billy really Badasses. Then put them into the Haunted Mansion, which we talked about last night. And between the haunts, the, uh, the manor being a phylactery, you take their we're Billy really Badasses away from them. Like, oh, fuck. Everybody sticks together. Don't touch anything you don't have to. When you have a character who thinks that hearing a crying baby coming up from a uh, different side of the manor, and it runs to the other side of the manor, only to find a decayed, crusty, crunchy, jerky-fied baby, and having the emotional responses, I'm wording this different from last night because that station, that, that chance is the more nicer version of just, I'm trying to be nicer over there. But the crunchy, jerky, ooh, look what I found, everybody. It's a depository type of uh, jerky um, uh, type scenario. And him looking at it, busting down, crying. Then the thought, the only way to make this better is for me to cancel myself with the child's rattle, uh, rattle toy. Or having a character decide that he really wants to get out of it really, really, really bad. I mean, really bad. And the only way is to jump out that window that has is 60 floors down plus into the ocean, which is another 50. So that's 111 feet into the ocean with rocks and all kinds of crap that, sorry, no matter how many clap, it's not bringing you back uh, there at uh, uh, Tinkle Bell. You know, scenarios. Yes, we could do haunting. We could do all this. But when you take the ability of their ability to say, ha ha, I am the big bad hero. It make them uh, say, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, you know, to a fine sound, then you have them. Then you really have them. And with uh, Curse of Strahd, I don't know what the old editions, but with the fifth, fifth edition is they go into a haunted mansion. And at the end of it, at the very basement of the place, you have two options. You could fight a creature that's going to most likely, if done right, wipe the entire party or one of them has to cancel themselves to make sure the rest of the party is able to get out of the mansion. Right there. No, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to. Well, why don't you do it? Why do I have to do it? Horror doesn't have to be big, bad monster. Or it can be all, it could be nothing more than the thoughts that are going through up here for the player and the character. Stephen King has done it right a few times. There's a bunch of horror uh, uh, authors out there. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe did it right when he did um, uh, uh, the heart, uh, the beating heart. I can't remember the name of the, the story. The tail heart? Yeah, or the raven. If you mess with their emotions and their mental capability, you have them. You could, you have them right there. I recommend only doing this with people that are 
are of grown-ups, of course. I don't recommend playing this way with kids. It's just that's a big no-no. But if you get the right group of people at your table and you you warn them, hey, I'm thinking about doing something special for Halloween. Or not warn them, that's up to you. And you put them through the psychological horror. You know, it will, will be a very interesting game. By the way, guys, how do you feel about pies now? <laughs> you know, I don't eat pies. It's not my thing. Ever since I watched Carl devour that pecan, that poor pecan pie at the game room, and Garrett was there with me, we both watched that in horror. So you know what I don't eat anymore? Pie. Pie. That's all right. You, you want to know what I really think about it? There we go. That's what I think. Oh, that feels so good. <laughs> I'll put everybody you back in the my point, though. Yes. All right. So, Jade, last but not least on this one, I think this will be our last one for the night. Uh, the uh, the how, how uh, as a game master, do you create dread and or suspense in your horror game? So it comes down to the five senses. Um, if you can invoke at least three of them, you are capable of capturing the imagination of the players. So I'm going to set up my description. I'm gonna I'm gonna I will sometimes go to a thesaurus and find more appropriate words that truly invoke one of the senses. And I'm gonna pick it in at least three of them uh, when I'm you know describing a scene. And I'll have it pre-written and off to the side so I can reference it. But the the first the, the key thing is to set the scene at the beginning of the night set the scene at the beginning of the session and and use elements of what you set in that first scene throughout the entire session for the evening um, and keep invoking those those senses um, either the three you picked or uh, more as the time goes on so um you know it, it describe the the temperature of the room uh describe the smells the the faint uh mildew or mold of uh, of decay um uh, you know invoke the the sense of of sight through um you know limited vision or even you know darkness or um you know the 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 horrid rotting um you know a body locked in rigor mortis as you know in this awful position you know that died in a very horrible way um you know if you can like, like i said if you can grab the imagination of the players with descriptive terms you have them they are yours um and they will be in that scene that setting the entire time you're you're at the table um, yeah, you might get a few jokes and whatnot, but all it's going to take is reset the scene. You know, okay, someone cracked a joke to, to uh, you know, lessen some of the tension. That's fine. The very next room they walk into resets the scene, and suddenly the tension is back. Um, the other thing you can do is, you know, don't let on that there are things happening immediately. Um you know the the player characters are moving throughout a scene, and they'll they'll talk with NPCs, and then you know they might go back and and talk to those NPCs again. Well, what if that NPC is not there? What if nobody knows that that NPC was there to begin with? You know, I was like, well, you know, where where's the the bar wench, uh, uh, Jane? Uh, we don't have a bar wench by that name. I don't know who you're talking about. You know, make the the players second guess some of the information that they have received, and you know, and don't do it you know with malicious intent, but do it in, in such a way that it gets them questioning. Wait a minute, you said the name was Jane. Yes, that was what was said earlier. I will confirm that. 
where is that person now? Nobody here knows that anybody by that name. You know, it, it gets them wondering, okay, so who did we talk to? You know, did that person exist? Are we going insane? Um, the more you can get your players to um, invest in what is happening in, in the, the scene and, and, you know, the mystery of what's happening, the more interested they will be. Uh, because, you know, curiosity is one of those things that once it's peaked, people want to see it through to the end. And it starts with great descriptions and it start, it's a slow build and it's a slow build of the tension. It's a slow build of, you know, the entire night until finally they're at the final scene and the tension is as high as it can possibly get. And the way you got them there or the way you know they you know discovered things it just kept building the tension building it higher you know making it more stressful making it more uh tense you know and you can do this through a multitude of ways you can you know increase the the stakes by increasing the dcs of things that they need to be able to succeed at the the target numbers of the rooms um you know the ability to hit things you know you can make it so that like well you know now you need like a 15 to you know 15 to 20 to be able to even hit this thing in the next scene okay well you're looking for a 17 or higher at this point on the die roll um you know and, and that's one way of driving tension is them not being able to succeed at things you know at, you know at the very beginning they were able to succeed at a lot of things the dc was only 12 maybe 10 and then you know as the night progresses things get harder you know as you introduce more um you know, dangerous things, the the difficulty climbs. Um, and, and I think uh, ICRPG does this really, really well is because they have an easy and a hard mode where any test on a room, you can say, hey, you know, you can do that, but it's going to be a hard test. So whatever the, the room number is, plus three. Oh, yeah, okay, you want to climb the, the ladder or you want to climb the bookshelf. Well, I guess those are natural handholds. Make an easy DC instead. Um so, I mean, you have in your toolbox as a game master a bunch of tools to use at the table, and they can all be used to drive that tension higher and higher to the point where the players are like, we need we need an ending or or we're not going to be able to sleep tonight. Please, give it, let, let, where is the ending? Okay. And I think that rounds us out for this. And uh, I, I still we've still got some more questions, but we can pick those up next week. That's not a problem. I was figuring this would be a kind of a two-parter. So, uh, Bruce, you said you had some stuff here for the end, anyway. Yeah, I did. Uh, I've got some start comments. <laughs> One's just kind of a, a small question. How many have ran a horror game like an NC version, NC-17 version of Scooby-Doo? And I, I think most of us probably have a slightly different answer than that. Like I myself, I've ran a, a few games where it starts off kind of kiddie-ish, but by the midpoint, we're delving into some adult situations. Uh, Garrett, you ever have anything like that? Not really. Uh just for the simple fact of you know it, it comes back to know your table so you know there there's certain things where you know there's certain things where at the table um i knew about some people's pasts that were probably not good lines across so they didn't get crossed that that is a problem that i have frequently uh, i've gotten better i mean I think one of the main reasons is that people just ignore me now or oh, Bruce is streaming. Let's do a live stream right now. Fuck it. And they, they do that and or they'll be like, uh, no, I don't want to watch Bruce run a game. Bruce is good at certain things, but there's things he does that. And I don't know if that's my issue, but I know that for myself, there's been a lot of times where I'll be over at, like, say, the game room, not the game room, uh, just for fun. And I'll be running a D&D game in the middle of the room, and I'll have my six people around me. And then, like, the, the players hack at a zombie, and 
they see that it does react, does have some pain sensors still opening, operating, but it's trying to keep its innards from spilling out and around its intestine, it's falling out. You see like a bunch of scarabs or hard shelled beetles come out of the, the creature. And that, that can go over pretty well with certain groups, but with a, a public environment like the middle of the game store, probably not the best. Connell? Is he muted? Uh, I ran games at a shop where uh, if it's for adults or for the kids, there's always that, that, you know, nothing more than a rated R for adults and rated PG, maybe PG uh, rating for kids. It's just this is at the shop. You have to play by the shop rules. It is what it is. But when I'm doing like a one shot over at a friend's house when I was living in Tennessee or wherever, I and I knew who I was playing with. It got hot. It got rough. It got dark. There, uh, like Baron said, there's certain topics I just just did not touch. But it was. I don't have a problem running an NC17 type haunted mansion type thing for uh a grown-ups uh you know like uh the 13th ghost or whatever type feel as long as the rest of the party i'm running for understands that this is where it's going uh no i'm not going to tell you everything that's going to happen you guys are going to find out for yourselves but you know this could go this could be dark i think I think your party that you're running for at least has to have a general idea where you're going. Um, not because you need safety cards or anything like that. It's just being polite, especially when you're gaming or you're using uh, subjects that are outside the normal com uh, comfortability of our day-to-day -day lives. I mean, if I'm Christopher Reeves, I'm running Christopher Reeves type movie type game and, or, and there's a, um, there's a town full uh, full of small children, boys and girls with blonde hair that have mental uh, powers. Uh, I have a bunch of blonde kids in my life. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I could do a village of the dam, but our RPG, or, but the players, you have to know where the party's line is. You can't cross. There's just some lines, even in gaming, you should not cross. And so you got to know your crowd. Okay. Um, I, I, I just want to children the corn type of uh, person, Connell. Uh, that the original. I read the book before I saw the original movie, and I just thought it was dumb. The only one that actually really fucked with me was Stephen King's It, and not because of the clown, but because I'm, I can't believe I'm reading this. I, I just yeah yeah. If you know, you know. Yeah, I was 14 when I read it the first time, so it kind of gave me hope, like, uh, maybe we would find a Beverly that would be hanging out with us, but... Oh, no. no. <laughs> if you know, you know, and Bruce, you're wrong. <laughs> I, I never said I held popular opinion. I've <laughs> never, I've never said that. When I was 14, that was, that was what we thought, you know? I mean, there was a bunch of us that were reading that. We, we were a bunch of English going to be English majors and like that was something that was kind of discussed but like the moment you're like I wish I had a Beverly and like all the girls like scoot away from you like that that kind of tells you like how popular you are um Kai yeah I have Did and I and when the words now most people I don't I most people are not really too cool on the idea of going NC-17 but I have a few groups that I in the past that, yeah, yeah, we're going, yeah, we're going that far. And yeah, it's, I feel sad that most people aren't that way, but hey, that, you, got the, you, you got the players, you got the players. And at that point, oh, it's fun. And the best part is, is if you actually do like a Scooby-Doo, a Scooby-Doo adventure, it is all about figuring out the I, the mystery. And that's the fun part. It's just more gruesome or more I, I a little bit more darker than usual i'm okay with that also yeah i have tried i, I have done 
done Vampire the Masquerade conversations out, you know, out in public at a Perkins at two in the morning or at a Denny's at two in the morning. <laughs> Why is it always I, two in the morning? Because, okay. <laughs> when you're gaming with I mean, friends. What else are you going to talk about, Vampire? <laughs> okay, when you're gaming with friends and you're playing, you know, into the weekend and suddenly, you know, you've, you you went out and had dinner at six or seven when, you know, all the bullshit normies are still open. But then because we live in the Midwest and everyone's a retard and the whole and the entirety of the universe closes at nine. And even Taco Bell closed at midnight or 1 a.m. And now where do you have left to eat? Perkins, back when they were still 24 hours, they're not anymore. Denny's. Which, congratulations, you are now discussing dark, weird-ass shit in the middle of the night because it's the only thing open. I would say, say Steak and Shake, but they're no longer 24 hours. What the hell happened? happened? Around. COVID. COVID happened, and now nobody's 24 hours anymore. And so there's no place for us. Alco- for us, I need, I, I don't want to go home, but I'm drunk, and I want food. Well, all you know, of the shifters are fucked because a bunch of fucking pansies got 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 scared of the Chinese coof. Um, there's, there's one food. place, Kai. Where? There's one place. What place? Richards under Maine. I know, but it closes at four. But that's okay. I can sit in my car for. But an that's hour four, not two. I know, but hey, I can end up in a bar, a, a bar, so I can continue drinking until four in the morning. I'm okay with that. But when? Hey, where? I know, right? Yeah, unfortunately, you know, L, L, you know, Waffle House is still twenty four hour. If you can, if you want to drive, especially from where we're at, if you want to drive the 50, 60 miles to get to one. Where's yeah. your Where's your Waffle House over in Peoria area? We don't have one. Um, there isn't one. We have an IHOP. We don't have a Waffle House. Away. Fifty miles away the, from the Peoria, cl- where do you have a Waffle House? Uh, Springfield. Yep. Yeah, they have a Waffle House in Springfield. Uh, it's not called Waffle House. I believe it's called Huddle House, okay. and I don't think it's twenty four hour either. And we have a and there's a few IHOPs that you can get there. So there's a few places that when you're desperate and you're gaming and everyone's gone late and now we want, we want we want food, so we've broken. We've gone out somewhere in the middle of the night, and this is where you get to find out the really weird people. And some people are just like, I don't care. I'm hungover. But then you find that one group of people who are playing chess or go in the back of the back corner of the restaurant. They're playing magic. Yeah. I've, been, I've been that guy who shows up there at, at two in the morning because me and the guy who's been playing go since 10, since 10 at night, are like, we need food. Take the whole board with us. Go to, and Go to Steak and Shake, set the board back up, put all the places back in, and start playing Go again. And yeah. and then having a bunch of weird LARPers come walking in, uh, walking in, because you know it's like it's late night, and all of a sudden they're like, like "What the fuck?" Are you? And then one guy recognizes the game, and then suddenly you got people watching you, and now we're all talking, and now we're making new friends because, hey, what are you doing? Oh, we just got out of a LARP. What game? Blah blah blah, and then you're t- and suddenly you're talking over you know a game of chess or a game of go. Meanwhile, my opponent is sitting here going, "It's your move, motherfucker. Start playing." And but yeah, but no, when you're sitting there at like four in the morning and you're and you're eating like your seven by seven giant giganto burger or your your third plate of fr- uh, chicken tenders because you know, you're hungry as fuck. And yeah, the bombas yeah. down in champagne burrito right. as big as your head. Yeah, burritos as big as your head. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember La Bombas. It, it there, is there all about on, on, uh, in Peoria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. off of Maine, it, but they've been closed forever. Okay, but that's the funny uh, part. it's just, it, it's just, yeah. Sorry, but I'm done. Sorry about that. Sorry about that, Kai. No, but it is fun well, to bes- to scare people when you're talking about gaming. <laughs> but, but real quick, the, I think the closest the closest Waffle House. I think is in Collinsville, if is I it? remember correctly. That's, I, I believe that's it's a hundred miles it, away. Almost. It, it, it's and... either that or up around Chicago, but I'm thinking it's down. In oh, okay, I got. See, I got Huddle from... House. Huddle House used to be affiliated with Texaco Truck Stops. They've got one in either Monahans or Midland. I want to say Monahans, 
And oh, that's we're talking Waffle House. Yeah, Huddle House is yeah. kind of the same thing, but with less class. You lose your dignity at Huddle House. <laughs> yeah, the closest one to us, the closest actual Waffle House is 138 miles away in Granite City, Illinois. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's the one I got. Which is I, I think right Waffle outside of Collinsville. Is, so, yeah. I think Waffle House is scared of the, of the frost line. So it's like wherever the snow the, the snow lands, Waffle House can't uh, I can't expand yeah. into that zone. Yeah. So FEMA uses Huddle uses uh, Waffle House as the Waffle House index, and I we, like that. Um, uh, we need a Waffle House up north, damn it! Yeah. We there was a time me, Jade, and the other fellow were traveling down to Tennessee, and we're like we're all fucking hungry. We're like there's a Waffle House. We're stopping at the Waffle House, and at the same time, it's like wait, we're in the South. Can I get sweet tea, please? Yes. Yeah. yeah the Actual Huddle sweet tea. House. Huddle House. There's one in Litchfield. There's one in Decatur. Yep. I refuse to go to any town. Williams, Williamsville. Williams. Yeah, Williamsville, Island, mm-hmm. um, Marion. Yep. Jade. Horror yeah. game. Uh, NC17 version of Scooby Doo. Um, if you're gonna do it, make sure you know your players. Make sure they're all on board with the idea of it. Um. I don't think it's necessarily a, an awful idea. Um, if you want some good ideas, you know, go watch uh, uh, Supernatural um, and crank that uh, crank the horror level up to eleven. Oh, I can um, see we were son. <laughs> or just watch the Scooby Doo uh, uh, yeah. Supernatural crossover. Yeah, so the, Scooby-Doo, yeah. the Scooby-Doo episode was very PG thirteen, if not just PG. Um, I mean, they they got away with I think a PG thirteen because of language, but there really wasn't a heck of a lot of violence in that one. Um, so if you're if you're gonna do a Scooby Doo NC seventeen, um, you know, crank the horror up to eleven, crank the uh, the gore, the um, the dis- the room descriptions, um, and and the monster. Uh, up to 11. Um, and no, that monster is not some creepy realtor who's just trying to, you know, get people to to leave their the place so that they can come in and take it. No, no, no. That, that creepy monster is actually a creepy monster, and it is actually there to maim, destroy, murder, uh, for whatever vengeful reason that it's there. Um, you know, if, if you want to go that route, you can, but again, know your players, know if and and make sure that they have signed on to this idea cuz not all players are going to be okay with this um and if if players aren't okay with it and you don't get their their buy into it they're just going to leave your table there and they may not come back which you know that's up to them that's you know again that's on you as the game master to make sure everyone's um on board with the idea of it it sounds that sounds pretty fair crafting gamer any uh, if if you haven't ran a Scooby Doo game, have you ever ran like a for your table? Like, are you more comfortable with PG, PG thirteen, R, NC seventeen? What what do you typically like? What what's what's your balance point? Uh, I'm not entirely sure what NC seventeen stands for, but uh, <laughs> I but I'm not a I'm not a PG. It's it's no less than PG thirteen. It's usually a rated R because. NPCs will cuss. I will say, oh, that character was ripped in half. And when you do, you see his guts just fly all over the place and things like that. It is not really anything below PG-13. And even then, I got to tell myself back to be that that tame. You you guys seen really nothing from me DMing because we weren't in those circumstances. If somebody got bit in half or ripped in half, you would have heard a great discussion of blood and viscera. Uh, don't worry. There will be a time. Um, we plan on keeping you around for uh, for a while because you're yeah. one of us. One of us. <laughs> you're, you're you're open to us and have open to conversation. Big big plus. Big big plus. I'll just say that. Um, that that it wraps up that question there. Uh, we do have another question from uh, my. Dirty campaigner, Flady. And I do have, a, uh, what do you call it? Memberships are open. Uh, two tiers. One's a $1 uh, 
one to ten dollar the, the one dollar is i guess i have a fan and that ten dollar is dirty campaigner dirty campaigners i pretty much invite to uh be at my table that i can have a table whenever i have a table and right now i have a table every other saturday i have one group of quote unquote heroic fantasy pathfinder and my other table is my beta test game that i'm running and i really like the hell out of it plays that group and so is connell along so with janet I need to send you ten dollars. I, I I see I see the error of my situation now. Okay, you're you're good. You're good. You you don't have to. But the 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 dirty campaigners like that's just something like right now. I'm trying to make sure that anybody that's on that tier, I want to get them in the game. No, that's um, true. Flady. I, I mean, I I, I, got, I want to scratch this guy's back. He does a lot of good commentary in the chats. I believe he's got some videos up. He wants to be a, a gaming guy, but Time is a finite resource. Appreciate everybody being here. He asked a question about how about a child werewolf to box the players into a moral quandary and how would you handle it as I plan to do so? Um, I think that's almost a good question we could put into a topic for next week. Yeah, yeah because we're, we're kind of running long and I don't mind running long, but my, I'm not everybody on my panel. So I, I, I want to treat them well and have them come back. But I'd like to, this this would be very interesting because I think werewolves, more uh, than vampires, get really good on the moral quandary side. Yeah, um, not to throw my own, uh, throw it, uh, whatever. Uh, this would definitely be great for next week. I also think we didn't do haunted and uh, horror or supernatural items. Like the box that got brought up, or a ring, or whatever. That that that's on the list for next week. That was I don't know what Kai next is week. grabbing, but he is definitely grabbing. Okay, one? no, excuse, excuse me. You mean this? I was grabbing a book of cursed items. I, I need to get yeah. my hand on one of those really bad. I mean, the box is Can't always see. your friend. The box is always your friend. <laughs> bring it the box. The box of wonders. Yeah. I'm going to just put it back in the, back where I found it and not touch it. Yeah, don't <laughs> open it. I also want to I also want to pinpoint guys. You don't want it in this form in this formation yet? <laughs> no. I also want to pinpoint Sky's uh, uh, uh Kai's shirt. What? No. Oh yeah, yeah. That is a great shirt. That shirt. Yeah. <laughs> Tim says, uh, "Talk ma the vampire masquerade at local country kitchen restaurant." My buddy's talking about Giovanni rituals and a couple of old ladies, a couple of tables over. Just give us the dirtiest looks. <laughs> I love that. Right there, oh, the they like you're, or they look at you like you're look at you like you're possessed. It's God, I miss Denny. I miss Perkins being Perkins. I yeah, mean, I cannot tell you how many college papers I wrote at a Perkins down in Champagne. That's when LARP and role playing gets done. It's after one a.m., not one p.m. <laughs> one p.m. for those on the other side of the world. Yes. And she was the tiefling in the D&D movie after being it. Wow. Yeah. The oh, actually, maybe there was a new version of it, wasn't there? Yeah, it's actually pretty good. Waffle House. We got uh, Waffle House and IHOP within the area. Although Waffle House is by, round, not by Round Rock, but over by Austin somewhere. And we've got IHOPs at plenty. IHOP really does a good job, I will say. Their steak's a little bit too thin for my taste, but whatever. Just buy multiple steaks. Just stack them all up. Exactly. That's when you go up to Grecian's up in Chile. And you get a freaking, on, on the weekend, you get a freaking, uh, uh, it's a cowboy cut. Steak. Yeah, but it's uh, prime rib. Uh, there, used it's, it's Chinese, there used to be a Chinese restaurant, Chill Coffee, I enjoyed immensely, especially after drinking hey, uh, Halo Moon. But they're long gone. I haven't been to Chillicothe in forever. All right. So, 
crafting game or what do you got coming up uh coming up this week this saturday i am releasing my next video on the robotech rdf manual which will be the specific about the north america the start of the north north america sector and tuesday i'm planning on doing a uh, halloween live stream provided somebody i don't want to be on okay. is doing it for me what, tuesday what day on halloween I'll be, uh, I'm doing my uh, reading of the thing at about 8.30, the things. I see you've left such guy. I think L did. Oh, oh, I, I was making a joke, but yeah, I can see why uh guy took off. Okay. So anyway, um, no, I, I'll be doing the, the reading of the things at about 8.30 at night, Central Standard Time. What time do you want to do live stream? Uh, I was planning on doing it sometime during the day. Shit. Probably somewhere between... Okay. Well, you're working so You're working that day? Yeah, I, I, I have no choice. I'm a plumber. Uh, I don't know how your scheduling works. Uh, I'm usually off by 6 p.m., usually. All right. That's four for me. I can wait till like four, four or five o'clock to stream. Okay. Fair enough. All right. So my question is, is uh, Garrett, you're, what do you got going on next week? Not much. Are you just kind of like in a you're 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 getting used to your new job, aren't you? Uh yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Oh. What are you watching Sunday? Well, if my life doesn't blow up on me yet again, because it tends to happen from now and then, we will be doing the 1990s um, horror, psychological horror, I guess be more apt for it, uh, The Flatliners. It had uh, Keith, uh, uh, Keith Sutherland in it, Julia Roberts, um, young Kevin Bacon, and Oliver Patts. I think it's his last name. People might know him from uh, The Three Musketeers because it's one of his best roles he's done, in my opinion. Uh, and it's a very interesting movie. Um, if I can talk the other people into doing it and they haven't reached out, I'd like to do another double feature. If we do another double feature, it will be Shadows, uh, The Creature from the Black Magoon. But don't hold your breath on that one because, like I said, uh, no one's yet reached out. We'll definitely be doing Flatliners. Um I hope to see you guys, some of you guys there. It was a good movie. Oh, for another quick movie uh, thought processing, there was a, uh, recently with the last couple of years, there was a King Arthur movie that came out. If you ignore that it's a King Arthur movie and uh, pretend in the back of your head that's a He-Man movie, it makes a great deal more sense. <laughs> was it a good He-Man film? It was a good <laughs> He-Man film. Okay. Because there's not many He-Man films out there. There really no, aren't. I mean, this you know, it was directed by um, the guy who did Snatch, um, <laughs> not the porn, the movie Lock, Stock, and Two Little Barrels. Uh, the gentleman. It's a good movie. I recommend everybody go out there and watch it. Just keep in mind, don't pretend to yourself this is a author, author movie, King Arthur movie. This is a straightforward He-Man movie, and it was awesome. It's it's. Guy Ritchie making an action film. I'm really not upset about this. I have to watch it now. Is it a Guy Ritchie He-Man movie? Which is a little bit of a stretch. Anyways, that's what I'm doing. And smoking more cigars. Because Jade, Jade, you're you're in the middle yes, of sir. doing some uh, some things for the home, and we we appreciate you coming in tonight. Did not have to, but it was great to have six people for the for the, the show. Are you going to be doing any more horror-themed sh 
shows like what you did beyond the door um i would like to um i need to get a play group together to do something like that but uh um right now i don't have anything in the works for producing uh any more of those um like radio style um uh, uh programming uh but don't don't get me wrong i would really love to do it um i know my microphone for the beneath the door series had uh some echo issues um i am working on on fine tuning the uh blue yeti that i got which is an omni mic um but I'm still getting echo out of it. Uh, I think it's either a gain issue or it's a um, room issue where the room is just too alive with uh, with noise. I don't have anything up on my walls. There's a lot of things I want to do to the tavern down here um, to, to be able to make it um, more conducive to gaming and, and deaden some of the noise, but I haven't done it so yet because finances are a thing. And, um, well, if I don't have them, I can't do can't uh, fund things like that so but uh no it, it is in my it is in my long-term plans let's put it that way i'll have to brow beat brown nose buy him a pizza uh, six pack of beer whatever it takes to get into one of those because oh. i'm just gaming with uh our uh, dear jade here i'm looking forward sunday uh we're watching Bright night in the Discord. I just put the link in the chat for those that aren't in there. Come on in. We're watching that. Fright Night, 1985 classic with Amanda Pierce and oh yeah, uh, Robbie Bell. Yeah, that helped shape yeah. my childhood. That that was one of the other movies that helped uh, shape my childhood. Great movie, and we're gonna watch that and discuss it on Monday with Janet. Uh, Friday night, I'm over at her channel where we talk a little bit harder topics on uh, the shit show. And then Saturday of this coming week, you and I are going to be in the big ass Pathfinder versus Fire Giants grinder. Looking forward to it. I'm not. Not that I'm not looking forward to playing. I'm just not lo looking forward to dealing with more fucking Fire Giants. <laughs> you guys chose it. You chose this life. <laughs> All right. Damn it. November 1st is next month, just or is next week, just like Elle said. A lot of people are happy that the yep. horror theme month is over for a lot of streamers. A lot of people talk about horror stuff. Uh, horror is not just a thing you do during the month of October. I think you can pop it any time. And I appreciate a good horror film in the beginning of uh, the spring. Not in January, because that means it's slated for uh, they don't have high expectations. But I think a good springtime horror film is great. Uh, just my own personal opinion. Anybody have anything else to say before we shut the stream down and send these great chatters we've got on to other things this evening? Oh, for those out there that are looking for a new system, I've been looking into it myself. Uh, check out Dragon Bane. It has, it's, it's crunchy, but in a lot of good ways. I'm enjoying the few Let's Play videos I've watched. And what I've seen, uh, what I've read, um, play what you want. But if you have a spare moment, um, moment, go check out Dragon's Bane. I think some of you might enjoy it. Some of you might not. But it's definitely worth a look. Sounds good. That, with that. And remember, everyone, a chainsaw is more fun if you hold it the right way. <laughs> not by the teeth, in your teeth. Okay. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you soon.